Just these four. Okay. Good afternoon. I want to welcome you all to Farm Chastain as a group cooperative of Chastain Park Conservancy and the North Fulton Master Gardeners. We are going to talk about fall vegetable gardening today. Farm Chastain is an urban teaching garden and we have been teaching summer vegetables as well as today fall vegetables. If you would like to look to your left and your right, you will see our pollinators to attract butterflies and bees. We have quite a few end of season tomatoes, peppers, and um, started planting our lettuces. And we have a very prolific garden and we'd love for you all to come visit it whenever you can. My name is Robin Pollock and I wanted to welcome you all today so that we can learn about fall vegetable gardening. What are we going to cover? Today we are going to cover sustainable gardening principles, cool season vegetables, how to prepare to plant in the fall, seeds versus transplants, maintenance of your garden, pest and disease management, extending your growing season, and end of the season tasks. At the end of the talk, we will talk about specific cool season vegetables, and then I will plant our fall garden here at Farm Chastain. So let's begin. Conventional versus organic gardening. What are your perceptions of conventional gardening? What are your perceptions of organic gardening? Well, sustainable to me is the best of both. Combines the organic and conventional gardening. There are no specific rules or required practices. If you are going to use a sustainable gardening garden, choose plants and varieties with fewer pest problems. You want to choose the right site conditions for the plant. Healthy soil is the basis for all healthy plants. Use mulch to reduce weeds and conserve water. Use cultural, mechanical, and biological controls to manage pests and disease. Use effective watering. And these principles that I've just discussed are not just for your vegetable garden, but can be used throughout your entire landscape. So cool season vegetables, what do they require? They require cool soil and air temperature to germinate and grow. You grow your fall vegetables or spring vegetables in the spring and fall, and many of them can last throughout the winter season. They usually will tolerate a light or medium frost. Fall vegetables generally have shallow root systems. Therefore, they need to be watered more often because they're often susceptible to drought. So in choosing your plants, choose the cool seeds and vegetables and plan to have them available to plant. Now, frost tolerant vegetables are divided into three groups. There are tender vegetables, which are all damaged by a light frost. These are usually your summer vegetables. There are semi-tolerant hardy vegetables that will tolerate a light frost. These are your beets, your carrots, your cauliflower, celery, endive, and most of all, your lettuces and parsnips. And then we have the third category, which are your hardy vegetables. They will tolerate a hard frost, and they are things like your broccoli, your Brussels sprouts, cabbage, collards, kale, parsley, radishes, spinach, and turnips. What are the advantages of planting in the fall? Well, we often hear about bolting. Bolting affects the quality of your harvest. As vegetables begin to mature and flower, it develops a bitter taste. 
were common in broccoli, lettuce, Brussels sprouts, and collards, and other greens. Vegetables in the spring tend to bolt in response to the days getting hotter and longer. We can usually avoid the bolting by planting our vegetables in the fall. A quote that I like comes from Rosie Lanier from Purdue University. When plants bloom, we call them flowering. When plants bloom when we don't want them to, we call it bolting. So just remember that they do get a little more bitter and so you can um, let them go to flower if you want and they will attract pollinators, bees, and butterflies. So how do we begin? First, we want to prepare the garden to plant. As you see in these raised beds, I have wonderful dirt. As a matter of fact, there are all kinds of worms floating around. But in order to prepare your garden for the fall planting, it's important to clear all the debris from the summer plantings. It's better if you're, even if you're not going to plant a winter garden or a fall garden, to do these things so in the spring they won't have insects that have overwintered in your beds. So first you want to clear your debris. If some of your vegetables from the summer are diseased, do not add them to your compost bin. But if they're still healthy and good, you can chop them up and use residual litter and bur bury them in a furrow to kind of speed decomposition. Please allow several weeks before you replant, and if you can give it a month or two, that's even better. In existing beds that are already uh, planted or were in the soil uh, in the summer, I add a half inch to an inch of organic matter. Things like compost, post, soil conditioner, and manures are really good for adding nutrients to the soil. For new beds, I like to add two to four inches of compost so that it can really, really get in the soil and give the nutrients it needs. Remove rocks, sticks, and other root things that are in your garden bed before you plant. When I'm preparing to plant, I add a balanced fertilizer. I add 10, 10, 10. Some vegetables are heavy feeders, some are medium feeders, and some are light feeders. A lot of the winter vegetables, such as cabbage, celery, um, and lettuces are heavy feeders. Bean, uh, peas, beets, carrots, and radishes are medium. So you need to have them fed when you plant them, and then again, a couple of weeks into the season. Now, Am I going to plant seeds or am I going to plant plants? Well, sometimes plants are hard to find. So it is a good idea to have a ready supply of seeds on hand. There are three different kinds of seeds that I use. One is a standard kind, which are in the little seed bags. The other are pelleted, which are coated. And the last type is seed tape, which you simply lay out in the garden. Follow the package directions exactly for spacing and depth. When I use little tiny um, seeds, I like to either mix them with sand or put them in a salt shaker and sprinkle them into the garden. In for fall, if the soil is dry, I like to soak the bottom of my furrow before I plant my seeds. Are there any questions to date so far? If there are, please write them and send them in and we will answer all of your questions. So if you choose to plant seeds, you know you have those three types. But often I like to plant plants. And when I'm planting a plant, this is a latinato kale or otherwise known as dinosaur kale, you want to inspect your plant for disease. You want it to be healthy, no insects, and healthy roots. If you bring home a disease or an insect from the garden center, it will live in your garden. So please try and 
pick healthy, green, lush plants. You also need to water the soil prior to planting. If needed, we don't want to plant in a completely dry bed. And we want to spread the roots of the plant if the plant is root bound. I also use, like to use a water soluble starter solution, such as Osmocode or one of the um, uh, solutions after planting that is high in phosphorus, which will um, aid in plant growth. And as far as maintaining your garden now that you have planted it, and in a few minutes we are going to plant this lush garden, you need to be sure and add mulch, make sure you evenly water it, and that you weed it. I like to add mulch at planting time to help conserve the moisture, prevent weeds, and it also moderates the soil temperature. Two to four inches of mulch when settled is most effective. I like to keep the mulch away, however, from the crown of the plant because you want to avoid rot and mildew problems. And if you give it just a little space, Excuse me, Robin, we've lost sound. We've lost your sound. Please unmute. You got muted. Mute. Okay, you got thank muted. you. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so um, and if, please, everybody would use the Q&A uh, on their Zoom to ask questions. Robin will stop periodically to answer them. Thanks so much. So I'm not sure we lost a little sound, but I wanted to review the maintenance of your garden is mulching, watering, and weeding. And when you hand pull, you can specifically get the weed. If you cultivate or hoe lightly to avoid injuring the roots of the plants that you have planted. I'm going to stop here and see if anybody has any questions. Yes, Robin, uh, we had a question to know whether or not you could share the slides that your uh, presentation is from. Yes, we can. And I will put, we will put them on the North Fulton Master Gardener um, website and um, you will be able to get them by tomorrow. And the video will be uh, on our YouTube And the video channel. will also be on our YouTube channel or the North Fulton Master Gardeners to review. Any other questions? Okay, now we're gonna talk about some of the not as much fun things in the garden, and that is um, pest and disease. We call this integrated pest management, and I like to think of it as a pyramid. We have three or four practices that I like to use. And the first one is cultural, which is looking. We then have physical, biological, and of course, last but not least, is chemical. In, um, cultural controls are things like soil fertility and pH. Uh, what is pH? pH is the alkaline or the base of your soil and neutral is 7.0. Most vegetables like to be between 6.0 out by getting a soil test through the University of Georgia County Extension Program. In my hand, I'm holding a bag, which is a soil sample bag for getting your soil tested. It comes with a, dis a sheet on how to do it. You take seven different samples from your garden, mix them together, let them dry and then put them in this bag. You then will put your name, your address, and what you're trying to find out the pH of. 
In other words, if you're doing vegetables, you need one pH. If you're doing flowers, you may need another. And if you're doing grass or landscaping, you may need yet another. Be sure to indicate it and they will send you back a computer generated um, sheet on the com uh, components of your garden. Remember, you don't want to just add lime or sulfur to your garden without knowing if you need it. So be sure and get a soil pH test, please. Secondly is adequate water and temperature. You want cool temperatures with even moisture. In addition, we have a thing called crop rotation. Crop rotation is, means avoid planting crops from the same plant family in one spot for three to five years. So what does that mean? That means that if you are planting cabbage and kale in this bed, I don't wanna plant it here for the next three years. I'll need to move to another bed. So you notice that our crop rotation chart gives us a plant family. The first one is coal crops, C-O-L-E. Many cabbages, broccoli, kale, collars, turnips, radishes, all fall into this coal crop. So that means that you need to rotate them in the garden. You notice that most of the fall vegetables fall into this coal crop and so forth and so on. And this chart will be also available for you when you're um, online. So, Again, back to the integrated pest management that we just started talking about. And there are certain um, cultural controls that we talked about, uh, like the pH, crop rotation, keeping your garden clean, planting resistant varieties. Some varieties have been improved and they are disease and uh, pest tolerant. That doesn't mean you won't have them at all, but they won't be as, men as many and of course mulching and watering are your cultural controls. The physical controls are things that you can do. If it gets really cold, you can put a row cover on. You can hand pick the bugs off. You can use traps and lures for rabbits. And if you have a deer problem, fencing is probably not a bad idea. So those would be your physical controls. Our biological controls would be attracting beneficial insects and minimizing pesticide application. Our final pest management and disease management is chemical controls, but that is an absolute last resort. Here at Farm Chastain, um, we use only organics. And so I like to use neem oil, N-E, E-M oil, which is an insecticidal soap. And you can just as easily use Dawn with, in a spray bottle with water. The problem with organics versus chemicals is they have to be reapplied often. If you have a rain, the insecticidal soap will wash off. So you need to come out and do it again. We also have another chemical, um, organic natural control, because coal crops, the cabbage loopers love coal crops. It is a, uh, a caterpillar, and you will know it by irregular holes in the leaves, small tiny little green eggs on the backside, or larva. I tend to hand remove them or use a tweezer, put them in a cup of soapy water, and if they get prolific, I use another organic control, which is called BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's very hard to say, so I just say BT. And you spray it on organic again, and it removes the larva and prevents the egg laying. Is there a question? Yes, Robin, we have several questions. Trisha okay. wanted to know, is it time to sow fall, fall seeds 
And can they be planted directly into the garden without the animals getting them? Yes, they can. And now is the perfect time. Usually you want to count back 18 days from when you planted it and add to it a few days for harvest and the maturity. So we usually we say between September 15th and October 15th is the ideal time for planting your seeds directly in the ground. Remember to mark your rows. When you do plant seeds, they tend to disappear and you forget what you planted where. So I like to have the seed packet and a little marker to label and give all the information that I have. For example, we have planted sugar snap peas in this arbor. And because of it, we don't know they're there because they're still underground. But if I have a label, I know not to plant anything there and that will allow it to grow. In addition, when I plant seeds, as I said, if they're little bitty seeds, I like to put them in a salt shaker with other seeds so I can just sprinkle them out. Now, other seeds that are great to plant this time of year are carrots, beets, uh, potatoes, things that grow underground. And the nice part about it, especially um, radishes, only take like 25 days to mature. So when I'm planting my carrots, I'll mix small radish seeds in there in the mix. Radish seeds will come up in a week to 10 days and carrots are very slow germinators. So that allows me to have the radishes, to pick them and eat them. And by then I'll see the little tops of my carrots appearing. Great. Another and, question? Yes, Minu would like to know what kind of mulch and will the mulch be tilled into the soil or does the mulch need to be removed every season? Well, that's a very good question. And I like to remove my mulch each season or turn it over into my soil. Um, the reason I like to add new mulch is because it is fresh and it will conserve moisture um, and uh, uh, avoid weeds and help give the um, soil a fresh look. And I think uh, so mulch is very inexpensive. Now at Lowe's and at um, Home Depot, they're selling organic mulch. So if you really want to be a great organic gardener, you can go all the way organic. Any other questions? Yes, Carolyn would like to know, do we mulch after we see the seeds sprout? She planted her beds with both transplant and seeds in the same bed. And I hope they're marked. So she wants to know if you mulch before or after. I always mulch after I've planted. So even if you have transplants, which need mulching, and seeds, as long as you've marked them, they should stay, uh, they should come up through the mulch with no problem at all. And we have another but, question on the mulch. Are you mulching with pine straw, hay? What is the material you're mulching with? You have a choice. You can mulch with whatever you like. You can chop up your litter from last year. You can use pine straw. You can use nuggets. Uh, you can use hay. Um, I tend to use small mini nuggets because in my garden, they're not so big and I can spread them away from the crown of the, the uh, root, uh, up the crown of the plant so that they do not suffocate the plant. And Constance would like to know that if you have limited garden bed space for crop rotation, how far away do the plants have to be the next year? just not in the same spot. You know, you could get away with a year or two, but if you can consciously say, I have this here this year, next year it's going to be on the other side, I think you will have a more successful garden. And then Linda would like to know about thinning seeded plants and can you replant the seedlings that you have pulled away from the main plant? Yes, you can. And growing from seeds and thinning is very important. 
because you're going to plant a lot of seeds in that space. You want to begin thinning when the plants have one to two pairs of true leaves. You also can refer to the seed packet and see what the spacing between seeds is. Um, the reason you sprinkle them in, and if they're big enough, you can place them in, is because some of the seeds are not always viable. And so by putting in more than you need, you can remove some of the thinning as the, seed, as the leaves grow and put them in another location. And we have one final question on fertilizer. Uh, what is the tin tin fertilizer you apply after planting? Is it an emulsion, organic? Um, so the fertilizer kind is less important than what it has. Um, I'm going to talk about fertilizer and what each of the things uh, mean in just a minute. So let's get back to that question if we can when we do um, discuss that. Is that okay? That's fine. And that's all our questions for right now. Okay, Robert. for now. So let's talk about our final um, pesticide precaution, and that is chemicals. Uh, I want you to be aware of these words. The first word is danger. So if you see that on a, um, a um, can, you know that that chemical is highly toxic. If you see warning, it's moderately toxic. If you see caution, it's a fairly low toxicity. Organic chemicals can be dangerous too. So it is very important to follow the instructions on the label. More is not better and may be very harmful. So I wanted you to know that so that when it comes to pest management, you can make the best call for your situation. So now let's talk about extending the season. The average frost date in Atlanta is November 15th. You want to water your plants prior to a frost. It will protect them and encapsulate them. You can also use a row cover, which is a big burlap contraption that is a, has a uh, bunch of wires over it, and so it is raised and can protect your crop. When I know there's a freeze, I want to water it. But if you use a plastic bag or a sheet, if you know you're going to have a freeze, it's very important to remove it the next morning so that it doesn't suffocate. If I just have one plant here or there, I must, might just use a milk carton with the bottom cut out, and that will work too. So that is one way that you will be able to extend your season. Now, there's certain things that we want to do at the end of the season. Um, if you choose not to plant a bed, but you want to clean it up, the worst thing you can do is nothing. So in order to get ready for your spring garden, if you're not planting all of your vegetable garden, you want to be sanitized and clear the debris. The debris can provide shelter for overwintering pests, and then they'll be there in the spring. So compost or dig under the soil, except if it's diseased. And then you want to add organic matter. If parts of the garden are not being used, I plant a co cover crop, things like crimson clover, winter wheat, alfalfa. Then come the spring, I dig it all in, gives extra nutrients, for the plant that you are um, putting and in the soil. So those are some of the, um, the end of the season tasks that we need to adapt. Now, remember we talked about soil pH and we talked about getting it tested. It's now come back from the University of Georgia and it says I need to raise the pH because mine is too low. I like to use lime. Dolomitic lime is a certain kind that can also add micronutrients to the soil. If you want to lower your pH, you can use sulfur or ammonia sulfate to lower the pH. 
you won't know what your garden needs until you have a soil sample. And they are available at the Extension Office and they are sent to the University of Georgia. They cost about $12 and they are well worth your investment. In addition, I like to um, clean and store my garden tools. And in January, when it's so cold and there's nothing else to do, I love to look through my seed catalogs and start making a plan for my garden next year. As a matter of fact, I never plant before I draw a plan. It's much easier to move it around on paper than to dig plants up. So now that we have talked about how do you grow your garden, how do you extend it, how to um, end the season, we are going to talk about specific cold weather vegetables. Um, I like to think of my gardening experience as horticultural therapy. It is great for me. It's a great tool for reducing stress, for managing anxiety, and generally increasing your quality of life. In these tough times where people are home, nothing to do, gardening provides an outlet that you just can't get anywhere else. It allows you to reconnect with nature and enrich your life through mindful planting, pruning, harvesting, and learning about plant-based eating. Um, I'd like to wrap this part of the uh, talk up by giving you five tips on deciding what to plant. So, to get your soil sample and analysis before planting. Choose plants that go, grow well in our zone. This is a map of Georgia. In it, you will see the bands of the different hardiness when the freeze comes. Ours is around November 15th. On the other side of my sheet, I have our zones. I've yellowed in Fulton County, and we are zone 7B. So when you go to look for your plants, make sure that your zone, that it is viable in your zone. Any questions so far? Currently, we don't have any any new questions except one more on fertilizer. Carolyn didn't right. apply fertilizer after she planted her beds last Saturday. Is she in trouble or can she do it now? Do it now, anytime. If you want to sprinkle a few granules in, did she do, not do it at planting time? Is that what she said? Correct. Okay. No, it's never too late. You can either use a liquid fertilizer or you can use granule fertilizer. Both of them work well, and it's never too late. Excuse me, Robin. Um, yes. We are uh, live on Facebook on both the North Fulton Master Gardener and the Chastain Park Conservancy Facebook pages, and we have some questions coming in from our viewers there. Um, All right. Okay. What and where are reliable sources of seeds? Uh, there are many seed catalogs. I will have to get back to you as, and we will post it on our website as to some of the better ones. I subscribe to a lot of catalogs, so I don't have a specific answer. I gather them where I can. It's important to look at the date on the seed package because sometimes stores have older seeds. You want to get them as new and fresh as you possibly can. And one more question about seeds. Uh -huh. uh, Beverly says, I have purchased packaged seeds that when grown are something different than what the package states. Have you found that? You know, that's funny she should mention that because yes, I have found that too. I think it is just in the manufacturing and maybe it is a seed that has um, changed over the, um, the course. They don't always stay the same. So I have noticed it, but rarely. So I think that really it's, it's not as, as big a problem. But it is important to keep your seeds in the refrigerator and package them up, close them so that they can perhaps be used next year. You want the most fresh seeds 
that you can get. Okay, that's it Anything? from Facebook Live. Okay, so let's go to the next section of this um, little class. And we're going to talk about the vegetables themselves. And then the th third and final part will be planting. So many, um, a lot of people think that the end of the summer is the end of the gardening. But as we gardeners know, there are many, many vegetables that can be grown throughout the fall, winter, and late spring. And you can enjoy them all winter long. So try growing a second crop of cool season vegetables and herbs in your gardens or your pots. I love fall gardening because the temperatures are usually mild, the diseases are less, and it can be insects and can be less troublesome. So let's talk about some of the favorite of the, um, the fall garden. One of the favorite is beets. They grow underground. It is a southern favorite. This root is a root vegetable, but you can also eat the beet greens. It needs to be um, planted in full sun and is a very quick growing vegetable. The soil can have uh, neutral or alkaline. It needs good root drainage and soil high in potassium for good root growth because this plant grows underground. It's very tolerant of cold and some frost, and you'll find that many of your vegetables that are underground are. Uh, harvest the bulb when it shows on the top, and um, don't forget the beet greens, they're delicious. Uh, they're nutritious too. Some of the varieties for Georgia are bull's blood, such as this, ruby queen, and they can be harvested within a month. Another er, uh, vegetable that we have is broccoli. Broccoli, all vegetables need a sunny spot of six to eight hours, but broccoli can be grown as both a fall, a winter, and a spring crop. They are heavy feeders and need adequate regular fertilization. I like to harvest them when the, uh, the heads are firm and tight. If you cut the stem at an angle, little side shoots come out and you can have some additional harvesting. Some varieties in Georgia might be Green Comet, Bravo, Cleopatra, but look at the tags. They have a lot of information. Cauliflower is a very popular Southern vegetable and they have very similar requirements as broccoli. Um, we, can be grown in the spring, winter, fall, and plant them in a sunny spot where they're e uh, evenly watered. They also grow well in cool temperature, and um, I like to get the heads bleached. So what does that mean? When you often see cauliflower at the end of a season, it often has brown on the white head. But if you will pull the leaves up and tie them, when the inside head, which we call a, a curd, gets about the size of a golf ball, as the plant grows, they will stay white and the head or the curd will develop. So that's a little trick that we can use to keep the uh, cauliflower white. Some of our varieties for Georgia are um, Andes, Snow Crown, Early White. And they have new varieties that have been grown uh, that are now available that have self-bleaching heads. Collards, another Georgia staple. Every New Year's Eve, we have collards and black eyed peas for money and lots of luck. And they will withstand a wide range of temperatures if they are properly conditioned. You can directly sow the seeds or the plant set them out and it exceeds turnips, cabbages and spinach in fat, cholesterol and, um, and nutrients. So they are very, very healthy and carbs, a very healthy vegetable. Some varieties for Georgia are Blue Max or Georgia collards. Other greens that I like to grow in the um, fall are mustard greens which are right here. They get very, very tall and are delicious. 
uh, along with the collards. Another one is Swiss chard, which also grow all season long and are um, very hardy. And so don't forget about these hardy leafy greens. The last variety of leafy greens I wanna talk about is lettuce. Lettuce grow really well till the first frost. They need the cooler fall temperatures to germinate. And it is one of the most giving vegetables in your garden, since you can harvest it many, many times. I like to harvest the outside leaves first and use the, and let the inside grow so that you can harvest it day after day. You can plant many blends or varieties such as butter, butter crunch, arugula, red leaf, romaine, and many, many more. Because of its shallow root system, lettuce is great to grow in shallow containers. So you could put it in a pot, and in order to harvest, like I said, just snip the outer leaves and let the plant continue to grow. Kale is another popular vegetable. We have a Latinato kale, otherwise known as dinosaur kale, and it is simple, simple. It is not only a superfood, but a super plant. This plant can tolerate cold, frost, and freezing. And they grow well in garden beds or just as well in pots. I like to harvest the leaves when they're about the size of my hand. And again, pick the outside leaves first and the center will continue to grow. So we're getting to the end of the vegetables. And we talked a little bit about cabbage. Um, it also is a cool season crop. We want to be sure and space these um, vegetables according to their instructions. Kale, cabbage require about one square feet when mature. So be sure you space them in your vegetable garden according to their planting directions. Now, um, I would be remiss if I did not speak about some of the cool season herbs. Growing herbs in Georgia can also be a, a year round activity and many, many herbs can tolerate Georgia's mild winters. Some hardy herbs such as rosemary, thyme, sage, oregano, parsley, chives, um, and lavender can stand the cool weather. Uh, once the weather gets really, really cold, chives will go dormant, but they'll come back in the spring. Tender herbs such as basil and tarragon could be brought inside and put in a sunny window still so that you could use them um, later. So I'm briefly going to go through the few um, cool season herbs. They too need six to eight hours of sun a day. And they can either be grown in raised beds, in veggie garden, or actually in your flower landscape. It's beautiful to have flowers in your ornamental garden mixed with herbs. So be sure and add a few herbs uh, to your garden. Thyme is beautiful. It's a creeping ground cover. And it can be used um, in vegetable paths, on garden walks, or in your garden. Be sure and add a layer of pine straw or mulch in the winter to protect the, your landscape, especially if you have herbs in it. Uh, in case of a freeze, remember you want to water ahead of time and put a cloth over it to protect it. Rosemary is one of the easiest herbs to grow. It is an evergreen, which means it will be forever green. It is drought tolerant and requires very little maintenance. It can also grow up to four feet tall and wide. So you do want to provide enough space for it to um, grow to its full potential. Parsley and cilantro are other winter herbs. One often thinks of cilantro as a summer herb since we have it with Mexican food. But in reality, it's a fairly short-lived um, herb, and we um, talk about it in the parsley family. But it's absolutely delicious. Um, parsley 
grows well in either sun or shade. Be sure and water the seeds if you're planting from seed. And when the leaf gets a three segments, you're ready to harvest it. So these are some of the um, herbs that I like to grow. Sage is also another one, and it's a perennial. It will go away and come back. So in conclusion, I'd like to say that growing herbs and vegetables is one of the most rewarding things to grow in your garden. They taste better, they save you money, you might get exercise, have fun, and learn something, and eat healthy, and have a great life. So thank you for joining us. I would like to see if there are any other questions before I plant the bed. And you can join Chastain Park Conservancy on Facebook or Twitter and North Fulton Master Gardeners with an S on Facebook, Twitter, and other sources. So Robin, are there any questions a, so far? Yes, we have a question from Anu. Does frost cloth is frost cloth needed for all plants in the winter time? No. And remember, frost cloth is only to extend the growing season. So in Georgia, we had a very mild winter last year. I never used frost cloth. I did not lose one plant. And I had my fall vegetables last all winter. And in the spring, they were still growing. So if you are looking to preserve something that you know is semi hardy, you might want to use it, or if there's a hard frost coming. Other than that, Mother Nature, the sun of the day, usually warms up the plants, so they are very happy. Other and questions? Yes, Carolyn would like to know, how do you keep good drainage when the raised bed is separated from the soil at the bottom with a hard surface? That's a good question. So, when you when you use a raised bed. It's important to structure it properly. Usually we have two by fours as our frame. And as you notice, these have wonderful aluminum uh, siding. You can use simple wood, you can use stone, you can use any material, but we have chosen to use the aluminum because our wood rotted. And wood in the garden has a lifetime with our crazy weather and the water and the rains, it tends to rot more quickly. As you notice on these, our top layer is raised, is wood. And I advise making them a little taller than a low garden so that you can actually sit on the side and garden. At the bottom of the raised bed, we have rocks. I have a net or a mesh wire at the bottom. Then we have lots of rocks any kind will do, the cheaper the better, to allow for good drainage. Then about half of the top of the planter is planted with newly amended and, and properly composed healthy soil. And that's how it goes through the soil, through the rock, and into the ground. And Robin, other question? Caroline would like to know, can all these fall vegetables be planted together in the same beds? Are they good companions? Yes, they are. And remember, the only thing I would recommend is if you have many heavy feeders together, they are going to compete for nutri nutrients. So my recommendation is try and keep the heavy feeders not so close to each other or separate them by a, a medium feeder. Because remember, they're all competing for the same nutrients and micronutrients in the soil. And the last question we have here is, do you cut back lavender to rejuvenate it? Uh, you know, we have our lavender bed, we have our perennial bed and our herb bed over here. And I think it really just depends on the health of your lavender. If you will um, notice, this lavender has gone to flower and there are crazy bees all over it. So this one does not need to be pruned back. If the winter attacks it and gets to it, we may give it a slight prune, but usually rosemary and lavender do not need to be cut back. And if you're going to prune it, 
prune it after it flowers because you see all these wonderful bees are pollinating our garden. And those are Any all other the questions. questions. Robin, we have a question from Priscilla on Facebook Live. Uh, would a Carolina Reaper pepper plant make it through the winter here? Mm, probably not unless we have a very mild winter. But a lot of these spring and summer vegetables, you can overwinter by bringing them into your garage and just um, put the pot in the garage, water it regularly but infrequently, um, and then in the spring, put it back out. And if we've had a mild winter, it should do just fine. But I usually don't overwinter my peppers, although they're super prolific right now. Today is October 1st, and our, our um, tomatoes, our peppers, and our eggplant are still very, very viable, and lots of them. And so you may not want to take out your whole garden until you see that it has expired. Once we get that first frost, the tomato plants, the peppers, and eggplants will freeze. So our final part of the, of the class today is going to be to plant the garden. So what I have done here is I have uh, placed my plants. And I don't know where my state is. Anyway, I've placed my plants accordingly spaced in my garden. A lot of times I have put oregano, thyme, at the edges because they are creepers and they are going to spill over. If you notice, I have parsley. Now, remember, you want to recognize, um, the spade, please. Uh, you want to recognize the mature height. Lachinato uh, kale gets very, very tall. So you don't want to plant it um, next to something that it will shade. Usually, I like to, thank you, I like to plant my taller plants on the northwest side of my garden. A garden usually likes a southern exposure. So if you plant on the northwest side, it will not shade the southern exposure. Also, if you have tall plants, you might want to put them on the top of a hill and low water-loving plants, drought-loving at the top, and water loving at the bottom so that they can actually take care of themselves. Um, in addition, we have um, mustard greens. Notice they start off very, very small. This will probably get two feet. So you want to know your mature plant heights. In most plants that you buy, you have a label. And the label is really valuable. I like to put little tags and copy my label so that I know that this plant, this cabbage, in 64 days will be mature to harvest. It also tells you the zone we're in and if it is appropriate to plant it in your garden. So I have amended the soil. I have added compost. I have sprinkled fertilizer. I've turned it all over. And now we're going to plant. Usually, I like to take the pot, turn it over, and this is a great example of a root-bound pot. So notice that the roots are all white and healthy. So that's fabulous. But they are so root-bound, they've been in this pot so long. So what I like to do is break them up, wiggle them, so that they will have room for the roots to wiggle in the ground. So I'm going to plant them in the dirt and then I'm gonna simply cover them. I'm going to be sure and add my label until I make my own. Whether you use a Venetian blind um, slats, an actual store-bought label, or make your own, it's important that you know what plants you have. Because this plant gets about three feet tall, I'm going to put my lachinata, and you see how really beautiful these roots are, next to it because it only gets two feet tall. Now, oftentimes, I like to do a planting. This interesting plant is called pak choy. 
it is a family of bok choy. And so it is delicious in the middle of the winter to do a stir fry with this pak choy. Often I group them and then I add some interest. I try and keep my lower growing vegetables on the front and the back and then allow room for my larger growing vegetables to, um, to take over in the centers. And a garden is something that's difficult to plant in one day. It can be done, but you really want to plan ahead. And gathering your vegetables is fun and easy. Uh, parsley, I mean, you see that with my vegetables, I'm simply adding my herbs to enhance them. On the ends here, I either use oregano because I like oregano, and it is also a trailer. So this oregano does not have the healthiest roots, but because there are few and they're white, it should do just fine. I also use thyme a lot, and you can use this herb in beds, paths, or pots. It tends to drip and love the way it um, scents the garden. So you see, it's a simple task if you plan ahead. And your garden will thank you for it. And after I have planted my whole garden, I then will water it. And by time it is watered and sun, it will have a great beginning. So as you see, I've planted the parsley we talked about. Here are the bull's, beet, blood, bull's blood beets, and they will be mature in about a month. So I like to do them up front so that I can see them. And they're a beautiful color in the garden. You don't often get this deep red. So I like to plant them to give some color and interest. And as you notice, because I'm an artist and an art teacher, I like to garden by color, texture, shape, as well as the science of gardening. So if you have a light green and a red, and a, it can make a beautiful garden as well as tasty and edible. So thank you for coming today. Thank you for joining us. I hope you learned something. You can follow us on Facebook or Twitter through North Fulton Master Gardeners and Chastain Park Conservancy. Thank you for coming. Have a great day and happy gardening.